trigger warning. If you're not used to having your long-held religious, spiritual, and cultural beliefs challenged by what the Word of God actually says, brace yourself. Hey, welcome back, friends and family. Today, we're going to go over the Torah portion, Bishalech. What that means in Hebrew is, after he let go. Who let go? We'll find out. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. Dimension as vast as space and time as vast as the spirit of the living God. In the middle ground between this is light and shadow, truth and a lie, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerazim. Between this is science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his hopes in God. This is a dimension of imagination. It's an area in which we call the Torah. Hey, shalom and my homies. Welcome back to another The Torah Zone. Today we're going to be going over uh, the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, and going through chapter 17, verse 16. Then in Hebrew, this parasha, the Hebrew word parasha or parasha, means a portion, and this is the Torah portion, Torah parasha, bishalech, bishalech. What that means is after he let go. So who are we talking about? Well, lots of things were let go in this Torah portion. I think it's fascinating. Sometimes the title of the Torah portion says something that, that, that makes you think and makes you want to be curious about what's happening next. So we're going to jump right in. Uh, and I titled this section, Take the Long Road Home. <laughs> it seems like one time I got to go celebrate Passover with an Orthodox rabbi friend of mine here in Colorado Springs. He's a Chabad rabbi, and uh, what I've noticed about Chabad, they're very interesting people, very, very well informed, well studied, um, and very knowledgeable, but they seem to take the long road to everything. So we went to their house for Passover, and we started doing Pesach, and of course they have to wait till sundown, and this uh, usually falls in the time of year after the time change. So, so then we start doing the, the Passover, some of it's in Hebrew, some of it's in English, and it was about 10 o'clock at night where we actually got to eat food. And they didn't finish until we left at 1.30 in the morning. Uh, and they were not done yet. <laughs> and it just dawned on me. These guys love to take the long road to everything. There is no shortcut in Judaism. There's always a long road. And so that's what I find funny about this particular story. They take the long road. So after Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not guide them to the highway that goes to the land of the Philistines, because it was close by. God thought that the people, upon seeing war, might change their minds and return to Egypt. So I think we're kind of taking a peek into the inner thoughts of the Lord and the inner thoughts of what God was already seeing, anticipating what the Israelites might do. So instead of taking the short road from Egypt to the promised land, they're taking the long road. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that's fascinating because God was concerned and if they faced the intensity of warfare after just being slaves in Egypt, this was not going to go well for them. Turned out it was the right move on God's part. I guess he's smarter than the rest of us, isn't he? He can see the end from the beginning. So uh, because it was so close by, um, rather God led the people by a roundabout route through the desert by the, the Sea of Suf, which is the Red Sea. The people of Israel went up from the land of Egypt fully armed. So they had all the weapons that they would need to do warfare, but they weren't trained in warfare. They were slaves in Egypt. They knew how to put mortar on a brick. They knew how to build stuff, how to make bricks, but they weren't trained in any kind of warfare. So we move on to verse 19. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Which, remember, Joseph asked them, don't bury me here in Egypt when he died. So they did, uh, they did embalm him, and he was placed in a tomb, which some archaeologists believe they found the tomb in the land of Goshen that Joseph was in. And that Moses and the Israelites, when they left, the, some of the traditions of the rabbis is that Moses personally took the bones of Moses and brought them to the promised land with them. Uh, Joseph made the people of Israel swear by an oath. And so normally it would take about 11 days to travel from Egypt to uh, uh, the promised land, to the land of the Canaanites. Um, but they took a much longer way. 
uh, which I think is interesting. And what's fascinating is we looked in the Hebrew word. We'll go through verse 20 real quick here. They traveled from Sukkot, which is actually a town near Egypt. Uh, Sukkah is a place of, a, of like a temporary shelter. So they came from a town called Sukkot and set up camp in Etam at the edge of the desert. Now, here's what's interesting. The Hebrew word for desert is Midbar. Midbar. In fact, that is the name of the, uh, I believe it's the book of Numbers in Hebrew is Midbar. And um, <coughs> I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, Bimidbar. So that means the desert. But there's another word in Hebrew that's called Mahdebar. So it's the mid, Midbar or Mahdebar. Mahdebar, it's spelled exactly the same way, but Midbar means to speak. Midbar means desert. And why I find that fascinating is we see a correlation of these words. In order to hear God's voice, for God to speak to them, they had to go into the desert. Have you ever had that experience in your life? I know I have. I was working at a church in Grand Junction and through a series of awkward circumstances, I was fired and they let me go. And uh, I ended up delivering pizzas at uh, Domino's for a year. Uh, while I lived in Grand Junction, and we switched churches, of course, after that, I started going to a Calvary Chapel with Pastor Jeff Johnson, a great guy. Still pastors that church in Grand Junction. He founded it 20 some odd years ago. I went through a desert experience, is what I'm getting at. I delivered pizzas, and I bought a car, a little diesel Chevette, for $500. And people say, I didn't know D Chevette made a diesel. <laughs> it was a tiny little diesel engine. I could get out and run faster than this car could go down the road. But it got 55 miles to the gallon. It was unbelievable good fuel economy. And, of course, it didn't go fast. So I never worried about uh, speeding tickets. But if I was going to deliver pizzas, that was the best car to do it in. <coughs> So that was one of many desert experiences in my life. And God is taking the Israelites to a desert experience. God will and has taken you through desert experiences. Are you going to pass the test or are you going to fail? One of my favorite quotes is, you never fail a test in the kingdom of God. You just keep taking it until you pass. So here's my suggestion to you. Pass it the first time. Don't wait 40 years to pass the test. Pass it the first time. The Israelites, on the other hand, were not quite so studious. So as they went through the desert, Midbar, then God spoke to them, Madbar. <coughs> so uh, I think it's fascinating that that's, uh, those words overlap or spelled the same way, but context gives you a different meaning. So they went ahead, uh, and the Lord went ahead of them in a column of cloud during the daytime to lead them on their way, and at night, it was a column of fire to give them light. Thus, they could travel both day and night. Neither the column of the cloud or the column of fire at night went away from in front of the people for the next 40 years. That's a little spoiler. I should give you a spoiler alert. They were in the desert for a long time if you didn't know that. So, but it's fascinating that this pillar, some have pictured it or envisioned it as a, a vertical pillar, others as a pillar a cloud covering that covered the entire nation as they were camped out in each area that they stayed. Sometimes they stayed at a place for a day or two, other times they stayed there for a year or two throughout the entire uh, traveling through the wilderness. But it's fascinating. So God covered them entirely in the daylight from the protection of the heat of the sun and at night from the freezing temperatures and the darkness of the desert, God covered them completely. <clears throat> So even in our desert experiences, he will cover us. We just have to walk in faith and trust him. So chapter 14 of Exodus, the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn around and set up camp in front of Pi Hichaot between Migdol and the sea. Migdol means tower or watchtower in Hebrew and the Red Sea, uh, the, 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 the Red Sea there in, in Egypt in front of Baal Sephon camp opposite by the sea. <clears throat> then Pharaoh will save the people of Israel and wandering aimlessly in the countryside, the desert has closed in on them. And, and then the Lord says this very powerful phrase, I will make Pharaoh so hard-hearted that he will pursue them, them as in the Israelites. Thus I will win glory for myself at the expense of Pharaoh and all of his army. And the Egyptians will realize at last 
that I am Yehovah. The people did as ordered. Now, that word for hardened heart, remember we had three words in the previous Torah portion for hardening of the heart. This word is chazach. Hazach means to be strengthened. It's the same word God spoke to Joshua in the first few chapters of Joshua. Uh, you know, every place in which your foot shall tread, I have given it to you, so be strengthened. Hazach, hazach, ubarach. Strength, strength, and blessing is what that means in Hebrew. <coughs> so, so God hardened or strengthened Pharaoh's heart, gave him the strength of resolve. After all these plagues in Egypt, after losing the firstborn of everything in Egypt and plagues and all of their gods being completely insulted and Pharaoh being insulted, his arrogance and his pride continued. Then after the Israelites left, he's going to still come after them. Uh, chapter 14, verse 5, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had changed of heart toward the people. Their heart was chazach, was strengthened. They said, What have we done? Letting Israel stop being our slaves. Uh -huh. So he prepared the chariots and took his people with him. He took 600 first quality chariots, as well as all the other chariots of Egypt, along with the commanders. The Lord made Pharaoh hard-hearted, strengthened. So when we come back, we'll go into what happens next in the story of uh, this passage, Beshalach. Don't go anywhere. Digital Pastor Jim will be right back with more Torah Zone. Hey, shalomi, my homies. This is Digital Pastor Jim with the Torah Zone. Every Friday night, beginning on the Sabbath at 6 p.m., Saturday at 3 a.m., 10 a.m., and 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'm excited to spend every Sabbath with our listeners here on His Kingdom Radio, presenting you the Torah portion readings and other Hebraic Roots insights. Come and learn about our Hebraic roots in Yeshua, Jesus, and His disciples. I'll bring a new appreciation to the Word of God. Let us know what you think. Feel free to contact us at 719-243-0996 or go to His Kingdom Radio website, www.hkrshineon.net. Send us an email if you have any questions or prayer needs. Hope to hear back from you soon. And remember, God has a name. Do you know His name? And He's chosen you by name to be His very own. Shalom Aleichem, my friends. Hey, shalom, my homies. Hey, if you've been inspired by our teaching, if you find this interesting and fascinating and want to help support the Wild Branch Ministries as we reach out to people across the globe, I would like for you to buy me a cup of coffee, a digital cup of coffee. So it's a digital cup of Joe. Just scan this QR code right here and buy me a cup of coffee and help support the outreach of the Wild Branch Ministry. Have a blessed day. Hey, shalom in my home is welcome back. We're jumping into the next portion. The Israelites are sitting by the Red Sea. They came down this narrow valley right up to the ocean, and that still exists today. Uh, there's lots of archaeological evidence, and this is the exact place. There's actually an underground sea mount or under the ocean sea mount that they passed over. Otherwise, on both sides of this sea mount, the water is several hundred feet deep, except a couple hundred feet deep in this one section that they could cross over. So the Egyptians went after them. Now, now think of this, Pharaoh's army, if you will, they have the most advanced military on the face of the planet at this time, at least that I'm aware of. They had amazing charioteers. These guys were well-trained, the chariots were lightweight, they were super strong, the horses were smaller, strong, fast, and this was like the advanced army of the advanced armies. This was like the U.S. military coming up against a third world nation. There is no comparison. We would mow them to the ground. And that's what's happening. These Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Now, sure, they have some tools and some weapons, but they have no idea how to use it. The Pharaoh's army was the most advanced, well-trained army in the world at this time. And so now they're coming after them. And that's a scary, scary image. The gold on the chariots and the jewels and the, the glistening in the sunlight, their clothes and everything that they wore. You saw this army coming after you in a distance. It made your heart stop because you knew they were coming to wreck you and wreck you bad. So Pharaoh, with his cavalry, cavalry and army, and he overtook them as they were encamped by the sea. 
Uh, and as Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and saw the Egyptians right there coming after them. In great fear, the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. It's like, they're coming again. Pharaoh didn't learn a single lesson and said to Moses, Moshe, was it because there weren't enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out to die in the desert? Oy vey, was is das? Why have you done this to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we tell you in Egypt to leave us alone already, being slaves by the Egyptians? It'd be better for us to be Egyptian slaves than to die in the desert. So they start grumbling and complaining. They're they're very klempt, <laughs> to use a Yiddish word. <laughs> they are upset and they start whining and fussing and complaining inordinately. They saw all the miracles that God did. All of a sudden they're afraid God can't help them now. Have you ever been in that situation? God's done miracle after miracle after miracle in your life. And then you come up against a challenge and you think, oh, this is it. This has to be the point at which I'm going to be let down. And I'm going to be hurt. And what is the reply here? <clears throat> so the Israelites are upset. They're grumbling and complaining to Moses that somehow God brought them out in the middle of the desert just to kill them. And uh, Moses answered the people, stop being so fearful. Fear is the mind killer. I think that's the quote from uh, the movie in the book, Dune. Fear is the mind killer. That's what destroys us, is when we let fear take root in our brain. And then it begins to express, manifest in our physical bodies and our choices. We begin to make assumptions based off of fear. What does Moses say to them? Stop being so fearful. What am I saying to you? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you today, right now? Look at our government. Look what's going on. It's nuts. I live here in Colorado. The Supreme Court of Colorado wanted to remove a presidential candidate from the ballot for a crime he was never charged with and never convicted of. And they removed him from the ballot. That's craziness. That's insanity. And then we see what the Bidens are going through and their whole family issues. It's nuts. I, it's, it's something that would cause me one to be fearful if you put your trust in the world around you. But we're not doing that, are we? We're putting our trust in the name of the Most High God. So here we come against this. Moses says, stop being so fearful. Remain steady and you will see how Adonai is going to save you. He will do it today. Then Moses said, today you have seen the Egyptians, but you will never see them again. The Lord will do battle for you. Just calm yourselves down. Isn't that true how that works? We have to calm ourselves down. We have to say, heart, do not be fearful. Put your trust in the Lord. I believe David said that in one of the Psalms, didn't he? Heart, put your trust in the Lord. Do not be fearful. Know that he is the God who sees, the God who cares. <clears throat> then we move on to chapter 14, verse 15. The Lord asked Moses, why are you crying to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift your staff. Again, remember the staff. Remember that? Lift your staff. Reach out with your hand over the sea and divide it in two. The people of Israel will advance in the sea on dry ground. As for me, I will make the Egyptians hard-hearted. There it is again. Chazach. I will strengthen them. They will come after you with more ferocity. Why does God do that? Because he wants the enemy to be completely humiliated and routed and completely destroyed. And they will march in after them. Thus, I will win the glory for myself at the expense of Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh in Hebrew is Pa-ha-ro. Pa-ra means the face of, ro means evil, or ra. Pa-ra means the face of evil. So we see a spiritual analogy. Egypt in Hebrew is Mitzrayim, the place of confinement, of slavery. Uh, Pa'aro is the face of evil, and God is subjugating all the false gods, all the principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness in this world. And then he brings them out to a place where the Israelites have no point, no choice but to trust him to rescue them again. God will do the same for you and for me. He has many times, and he will do it again many times. We have to trust him. He hardens the heart of the enemy, strengthens them, so they'll come after you. God makes a promise. You know what? You're doing, you know how you're doing the right thing? Because the spiritual warfare gets a little bit worse. And that's where you got to get a lot more stronger. You have to take your eyes off the things of this world and get them focused on the things of God and trust him even through the darkest times. 
They will march in after them. I will win the glory for myself at the expense of Pharaoh, his army, his chariots, and his cavalry. Then the Egyptians realize that I am Yehovah, and I have won my glory at the expense of Pharaoh and the chariots of his cavalry. <clears throat> in verse 19, the angel of God who is going ahead of the camp of Israel. Now it's describing the pillar of cloud as an angel of God, a messenger of God. Uh, I think it's the, the captain of the Lord's army is in Yeshua himself, Jesus. And he moved away and went behind them, and the column of the cloud moved away front in front of them and stood behind them. So the Israelites are backed up next against the sea. The Pharaoh and his army is coming the other way. The pillar of cloud is in front of them towards the sea, but then it moves around behind them and blocks them with a, with a blanket of darkness, <clears throat> which is fascinating. It stationed itself between the camp of Egypt and the camp of the Israelites. And the cloud was darkness, but the light, but but the light by night there. So on one side the cloud remained dark, like a huge bank of fog. On the other side it was lit up so the Israelites could still see. Uh, all night long Moses reached his hand out over the sea. The Lord caused the sea to go back, and a strong east wind all night dried the pathway. One of the the Hebrew words implies that it became gelatinous. It, be, it just literally solidified the walls of the water and created what appeared to be almost like a canyon through the water. Uh, and the, as, they, uh, as they began to walk through, uh, the, they walked through on dry land. It wasn't muddy, it wasn't wet. Then the people of Israel went to the sea on dry ground with the water walled up or, or um, uh, became uh, congealed on both sides, to the right and the left. The Egyptians continued their pursuit, going after them into the sea. All of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and cavalry, the whole army of Egypt, all of the best of the best, went charging in after them just before dawn. So it was still dark out. The Egyptians, all they could see is the Israelites wandering off across from the distance, and then these, these congealed walls of water. Maybe to them it looked more like canyon walls, like the canyon continued. It was very dark, <clears throat> and they started marching in after them. And the Lord said to Moses, verse 26, Reach your hand out over the sea, and the water will return and cover the Egyptians with the chariots and the cavalry. So after all the Israelites got through, then Moses reached his hand out. The congealed walls began to dissolve and pour in on Pharaoh and his army. And there was nothing they could do to escape. And it threw them into a panic. The wheels on their chariots were caused, miraculously somehow, to break off. And that they could not, they could only move with great difficulty. The Egyptians said, "The Lord is fighting for Israel against the Egyptians. Let's get away from them." Oh, now they want to get away. They should have done that months before. <laughs> and the Lord said to Moses, "Reach out your hand all over the sea, and will turn and cover the Egyptians in the chariots. Not even one chariot of them was left, and it was walled up from the right to the left. On that day, the Lord saved Israel from the Egyptians." Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the shores. When Israel saw the mighty deed of the Lord had performed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. Fear is in respect. And they believed in the Lord and his servant, at least temporarily. <laughs> we'll see what's coming next. Next, we'll go over the song of victory of the Israelites in this particular passage. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Digital Pastor Jim will be right back with more Tour Zone. Hey, this is Digital Pastor Jim. I want to let you know you can join us on YouTube at the Wild Branch Ministries on YouTube. Every Friday evening, we'll upload the current Torah Zone portion so you can celebrate with us the evening of the Sabbath and follow us on the Torah portion. Have a blessed day today, my friends. Hey, shalom, my homies. This is Digital Pastor Jim with the Torah Zone. Every Friday night, beginning on the Sabbath at 6 p.m., Saturday at 3 a.m., 10 a.m., and 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'm excited to spend every Sabbath with our listeners here on His Kingdom Radio, presenting you the Torah portion readings and other Hebraic Roots insights. Come and learn about our Hebraic roots in Yeshua, Jesus, and His disciples. I'll bring a new appreciation to the Word of God. Let us know what you think. Feel free to contact us at 719-243-0996 or go to His Kingdom Radio website, www.hkrshineon.net. 
Send us an email if you have any questions or prayer needs. Hope to hear back from you soon. And remember, God has a name. Do you know his name? And he's chosen you by name to be his very own. Shalom Aleichem, my friends. Hey, shalom, my homies. Now we're getting to what I think is the most exciting part of this particular passage. I mean, great. The story is very dramatic about the, the walls of water and parting the sea and Pharaoh and the Egyptians and all that stuff. And now they're all washed up. They're all, the entire Egyptian army is destroyed. Uh, the most powerful army on the earth has been destroyed. They all drowned. And uh, now and we're in chapter 15. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song unto the Lord. I will sing unto the Lord, for he is exalted, the horse and its rider thrown into the sea. There was a song we sang back in the, in the Jesus People Movement days. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider fall into the sea. You might remember that song if you're old enough. <laughs> and then verse 2, Yah, which is another conjugation of God's most holy name, Yah is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Salvation, you know what the word salvation is in Hebrew? Salvation is Yeshua. I love that. This is my God, and I will glorify him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Adonai, Yehovah, is a warrior. Yehovah is his name. So the Lord is strong and mighty, and, and the name Yeshua is right in the middle. Yeshua means God is my salvation in Hebrew. Yehoshua, which is Joshua's name in Hebrew, means God will be my salvation. So the people are actually singing praises to the Most High God using the name Yeshua in Hebrew. I love that. 90% of the time when you see the word salvation in the Old Testament, it literally says Yeshua in Hebrew. So we could translate it that way if you want to. Yah, which is the Father, is my strength and my song, and he has become my Yeshua, Jesus. This is my God, I will glorify him my father's God, and I will glorify, exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name, Yehovah. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he hurled into the sea. His elite commanders were drowned in the sea of Suf, which is the Red Sea. The deep waters covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Adonai, is sublimely powerful. Your right hand, Adonai, or Yehovah, shatters the foe. By your great majesty, bring down your enemies. You send out your wrath to consume them like stubble. With a blast from your nostrils, the waters piled up and congealed. The waters stood up like a wall. The depths of the sea became firm ground. And the enemy said, I will pursue and overtake and divide the spoil of the gorge of the, this, divide the spoil and gorge myself on the pea on them. I will draw my sword my hand will destroy them. You blew with your wind, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, Lord, among the mighty? Who is like you, sublime in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? Who is like our God? You reached out with your right hand. Now, the right hand represents authority. The right hand represents God's power, his majesty, his strength, and his authority. You reached out with your right hand. The earth swallowed them. In your love, you led the people and redeemed your strength. You guided them to your holy abode. The people have heard and they tremble. Anguish takes hold of those who, who, uh, who are living in uh, Pleshet, and the chiefs of Edom are dismayed. Trepidation seizes the heads of the Moabites, and all those living in the land of Canaan are melted away. Terror and dread fall on them and continues with this song of praise. You will bring them and plant them in the mountain, which is your heritage. Adonai will reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went with his chariots and his cavalry into the sea, but the Lord brought the sea waters back upon them. And the people of Israel walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. And then Miriam, who's Moses' sister. Now Miriam, her name means bitterness. Miriam. And that's actually the name of Jesus' mother. In English, we say Mary for some reason, but her name's actually Miriam. It's the same name. And it refers to her as a prophetess, sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out with their tambourines dancing, as Miriam sang to them, Sing to Yehovah, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider is thrown into the sea. 
And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful story of praise and worship. The people are, are overcome. Suddenly they see the majesty and the glory of God, what he's done for them. He's brought them out of a place of confinement. He, they face the face of evil. All of the false gods of Egypt, of this world, were brought down to, to, uh, to the grave. And now we see the people rejoicing and praising God. But how quickly we forget, right? We have these great victories. And we see this over and over in Scripture with Elijah the prophet after he calls fire down from heaven on the, the prophets of uh, Baal and Jezebel. And the whole thing's consumed and they're all consumed. Then Jezebel looks at Elijah and says, I, I will kill you before this day is over. And he's overcome with fear and he takes off running. How many times have we had that in our lives where God did amazing victory and we still after praising Him and worshiping Him, are tempted to give in to our fear and our shortcomings. And that's what happens next in this next portion. <clears throat> so this is uh, verse 22 of chapter 14. Moses led the people of Israel onward from the sea of Suf. And uh, for they went out, uh, and after traveling for three days in the desert, they found no water. I guess you need water in the desert. We always need water. After three days of drinking of not drinking water, human beings usually die or start to die. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, the people grumbled against Moses and asked, what are we to drink? Moses cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a certain piece of wood, which he threw into the water and made the water taste good. So the water was bitter, it was poisonous, it was, some say it was salty or acidic, I'm not sure exactly what. Uh, and, uh, so they made rules. So then God begins to give them some rules and laws for them to live by. <clears throat> and he said, if you will listen intently to the voice of the Lord your God. Remember, voice in Hebrew is midibar, <laughs> midaber, and desert in Hebrew is midbar. They're spelled exactly the same way. But in context, it says something different. So Moses is telling the people, if you will listen intently to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right, pay attention to his commands, and observe his laws, I will not afflict you with any of these diseases I brought on the Egyptians. Because I am Yehovah Rapha, I am the Lord your healer. They came to Elam where there were twelve springs and seventy palm trees, and they camped there by the water. So they had bitter water, Moses found a branch that God showed him, threw it in the water, made the water fresh and drinkable, and then Moses says, God's got rules for us to go by. He's got things he wants us to do. He wants us to understand his commands and his greatness and how to get through these things. But you have to obey and follow him. Jesus does the same thing, doesn't he? Yeshua, he gave his commands. They will know you're my disciples by your love one for another. And then Jesus said, I, uh, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another and that you obey my commands. I believe the commandments of the Torah were given by Jesus, Yeshua himself. And I believe, that, as Paul teaches in the New Testament, that we're to follow the, the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law, because Paul says the letter brings death, but to follow the spirit of the law. And as we get into the Leviticus, we'll go over what some of those laws are. And it's a fascinating study. Uh, and that'll make more sense to you why it's important for us to know the Levitical laws, even though some of them will never apply to us as individuals. It gives us instructions on how to follow God with our whole hearts. Very important. So uh, we move down to chapter 16. They traveled on from Elam. The whole community of the people of Israel arrived at the, the desert between Elam and Sinai, or Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after leaving the land of Egypt. There in the desert, the whole community of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Ah, the praise and exaltation of the Lord didn't last very long, did it? Just get them a little hungry and a little thirsty, and pretty soon they're grumbling and complaining. The people of Israel said to them, We wish the Lord had used his own hand to kill us in Egypt. Ah, the fussing, the whining. Then we used to be around the pots with meat boiling. We had as much food as we wanted. He didn't have that much food as a slave. They didn't have hay to make the bricks anymore. <laughs> but you have taken us into the desert to let the whole assembly starve us to death. Oh, you poor people. And, and the Lord said to Moses, Here, I will cause bread to rain down from heaven. Literally, bread from heaven. The people, you're going out, gather the rations every day, 
and I will test whether they will observe my Torah, my commandments, my instructions, or not. So here's one of the first clear instructions coming before Mount Sinai. He says, I'll give you manna, but follow my directions, my bread from heaven. <clears throat> On the sixth day, when they prepare what they have brought in, it will turn out to be twice as much as they gather on all the other days. Very important. Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, this evening you'll realize it had been the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. You should have realized that by now already. Anyway, and in the morning <laughs> you will see the Lord's glory, for he listened to your grumblings against the Lord. And Moses added, what I have said will happen, and the Lord gives you meat. He will fill you with bread tomorrow, and he will bring you meat. Your grumblings are not against us, but against the Lord. So we're going to take a break here real quick, and when we come back, we'll go into some fascinating miracles about how God provided for the Israelites in Egypt. Don't go anywhere. Digital Pastor Jim will be right back with more Torah Zone. Hey, this is Digital Pastor Jim. I want to let you know you can join us on YouTube at the Wild Branch Ministries on YouTube. Every Friday evening, we'll upload the current Torah Zone portion so you can celebrate with us the evening of the Sabbath and follow us on the Torah portion. Have a blessed day today, my friends. Hey, shalom, my homies. This is Digital Pastor Jim with The Torah Zone. Every Friday night, beginning on the Sabbath at 6 p.m., Saturday at 3 a.m., 10 a.m., and 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'm excited to spend every Sabbath with our listeners here on His Kingdom Radio, presenting you the Torah portion readings and other Hebraic Roots insights. Come and learn about our Hebraic roots in Yeshua, Jesus, and His disciples. I'll bring a new appreciation to the Word of God. Let us know what you think. Feel free to contact us at 719-243-0996 or go to His Kingdom Radio website, www.hkrshineon.net. Send us an email if you have any questions or prayer needs. Hope to hear back from you soon. And remember, God has a name. Do you know His name? And He's chosen you by name to be His very own. Shalom Aleichem, my friends. All right, welcome back. Shalom, my homies. So we're back into the Israelites have crossed over uh, the Red Sea. The Egyptians are drowned. They sing all these great praises to God. Three days, and they don't have any water, so they start grumbling and complaining. And now a few days later, they don't have anything to eat. They want food. God says, I'll give you bread from heaven, and I'll even bring some meat for you. So we're in uh, chapter 16, verse 9. Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole community of Israel, Come close to the presence of the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. That's kind of like I picture my mom when I was a little kid. She grabbed me by the shirt saying, Come close. I heard you complaining about what you had to eat. <laughs> I was a very picky eater. I still am. So, and Aaron spoke to the whole community of the people of Israel. They looked towards the desert, Midbar, Bimidbar, Bim, and they, there before them the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel. Say to them, At dusk you will be eating meat. And in the morning, you will have your fill of bread. That's a great promise from God. I love it. Then you will realize that I am the Lord, your God. That evening, quail came up and covered the camp. While in the morning, there was a layer of dew all over the camp. And when the dew had evaporated, the surface of the desert was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. And when they saw it, they asked each other, Manhu, in Hebrew means, what is it? Manhu? And became, they didn't know what it was. And Moses answered them, it is the bread which the Lord had given you to eat. Here's what the Lord ordered. Each man is to gather according to his appetite, take an omer, which is like a two-quart basket, per person for everyone in his tent, and that's what you get to eat. Some gathered more, some gathered less. But whoever's gathered little had no shortage, nevertheless, each person had gathered according to his appetite. So whatever they gathered <clears throat> was what they needed to eat. <clears throat> and they ate until they were full, and, uh, which I think is another miracle. It's, to me, it's a precursor of Jesus feeding the 5,000 with five loaves and uh, two fish. The bread from heaven <clears throat> and the quail. 
So Moses told them, no one is to leave any of it until morning. But they didn't pay attention to Moses. Some kept the leftovers until morning. It bred worms and rotted, which made Moses angry at them. So they gathered in the morning, after morning, each person according to his appetite. But the sun grew hot and it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread. Why the sixth day? Because the Sabbath, Shabbat, is a day of rest. This is the first clear instructions from God about what the Sabbath is. <clears throat> so God says, tomorrow is a holy Shabbat for the Lord. Or Moses is telling them, this is what the Lord had said. Tomorrow is a holy Shabbat, Sabbath. Bake what you want to bake, boil what you want to boil, and whatever is left over, set aside to keep for morning. Uh, and as Moses had ordered, they, and, if they, and when they did, it didn't rot or have worms like it did previously. Today, eat that because today is Shabbat, or day of rest, for the Lord. Today you won't find it in the field. Gather it six days. But on the seventh day, which is Saturday in our calendar, is a Shabbat. On that day, you won't, you won't be, there won't be any. However, there'll be plenty for you to eat that will last over and not rot. How long, so at the, the Lord Yehovah said to Moses, How long will you refuse to observe my commands mitzvot in Hebrew and teachings. Look, Yehovah has given you the Sabbath. This is what he's providing bread for two days on the sixth day. Uh, So the people rested on the seventh day. The people called the food manna. In Hebrew means, what is it? I don't know. (laughs) What is it? It, They say it tasted like, uh, it says right here, it was like coriander seed, white, and tasted like a honey cake. So it was like a seedy, sort of a grainy flavor, but it had a very sweet quality to it. So it had carbs and assumably protein and all the nutrients they need to live on. Moses said, here's what the Lord has ordered. Let two quarts of manna be kept through all your generations so you'll be able to see the bread which I fed you in the desert. So they put these quarts inside the Ark of the Covenant. Eventually is where they put it. But they, they set the manna aside. Take a jar and put two quarts of manna <clears throat> and kept it through all your generations. The people of Israel ate manna for 40 years until they came to an inhabited land, which is 40 years later, the the promised land. They ate manna until they arrived at the borders of Canaan or Canaan. So I think it's fascinating. God provided for them supernaturally. He gave them what they needed. He gave them food and water and provided for them even meat in the quail. And yet the people still had a tendency to grumble and complain. Why do you think that's so? You would think if they saw all these traumatic miracles, all these amazing signs and wonders, that there would be a sense of gratitude and trust. I think part of this is because they weren't born again. They were still slaves in their mind. They were still used to thinking in the temporary, in the temporal way of life, to not stay focused on what God was going to provide. Now we have a similar temptation. We have to watch and pay attention. We have to trust in the Lord with our whole hearts and to not lean on our own understanding, but to acknowledge Him in all our ways. And then He promises He will make our path straight. We have the story of the Israelites in the desert. They didn't have any of these stories. So we have the lesson of how to behave. We have this example of what to do and what not to do. So pay close attention. As Yeshua said often, to him who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. So we need to pay attention. We need to listen to what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us. God provided them supernaturally for 40 years in the wilderness, for water and for food. And he continues to do that for his people. Now, when they came to the place of the promised land, all of that stopped and they had to grow their own crops. They had to mature as a culture and to become not slaves anymore in the desert, but now a people that God was raising up as a holy nation, pure and upright before him, to be good stewards of the land and good stewards of the resources he gave them. So now we come down to chapter 17. The whole community of the people of Israel left the desert traveling in stages. So this is a very orderly transport they were taking place. They were in groups and they were in divisions. And this was not a mob of people just mobbing as they went everywhere they went. 
This is very orderly. God, the God we serve is a God of order and discipline. He wants us to be disciplined internally, and He wants us to be disciplined externally. And that's what's being emphasized here. The Lord had ordered and camped at Redfim, and there was no water for the people to drink. The people again quarreled with Moses, demanding, give us water to drink. But Moses replied, why pick a fight with me? <laughs> why are you testing the Lord? However, the people were thirsty for water, and they grumbled against Moses. Oh, that Moses, he just, he don't care about us. He's got what he needs, oh, Moses. For what did you bring us up from Egypt? To kill us, our children, our livestock with thirst? Oy vey, so dramatic, was is das? That's German, sorry, I'm just a little German with my Yiddish. Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're ready to stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, go on ahead of the people and bring with you the leaders of Israel. Take your staff in your hand. Ah, that trusty staff, that stick. Uh, it's interesting that in English we use the word staff for the functioning of an organization. We have our staff. And the same thing, Moses had his staff. <clears throat> it's what he leaned on. It's what he performed the miracles with. It's what, and many times in ancient cultures, the staff, they kept it throughout their lives. And they would mark on it and write on it significant events in their life. And I'm assuming Moses probably did the same thing with his staff. Uh, here's where we crossed the Red Sea. Here's where Pharaoh rebelled against God and li wouldn't listen to me and all the plagues of Egypt. And then he's marking on this big old staff. And here's where the people, even though God rescued them, they still grumbled and complained and whined and fussed. <laughs> His staff's going to be full of interesting little diagrams and drawings, I'm sure. So the Lord said to Moses, go ahead of the people, bring your staff uh, and strike the river. Let's see, the one that you struck the river with and stand in front of you uh, of this great rock at Horeb. You are to strike the rock and the water will come out of it so the people can drink. Moses did this in the sight of the leaders of Israel. The place was named Massah, the place of testing, and Meribah, or Meribah, the place of quarreling, testing and quarreling. Because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by asking, is the Lord with us or not? Why would you need to ask that question, right? Then Amalek came and fought with Israel. So what's fascinating is Moses struck the rock and water began to flow out of the rock. And then it says later in the New Testament, it talks about how <clears throat> that rock followed them all throughout the wilderness. So uh, we're going to come back in this next section and close it up. But I wanted to, uh, I just wanted to bring you up to the point of where Moses, using his staff, struck the rock. Coming up next is the conclusion of this Torah portion. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Digital Pastor Jim will be right back with more Torah Zone. Hey, shalom my homies. Hey, if you've been inspired by our teaching, if you find this interesting and fascinating and want to help support the Wild Branch Ministries as we reach out to people across the globe, I would like for you to buy me a cup of coffee, a digital cup of coffee. So it's a digital cup of Joe. Just scan this QR code right here and buy me a cup of coffee and help support the outreach of the Wild Branch Ministry. Have a blessed day. Hey, shalom, my homies. This is Digital Pastor Jim with The Torah Zone. Every Friday night, beginning on the Sabbath at 6 p.m., Saturday at 3 a.m., 10 a.m., and 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'm excited to spend every Sabbath with our listeners here on His Kingdom Radio, presenting you the Torah portion readings and other Hebraic Roots insights. Come and learn about our Hebraic roots in Yeshua, Jesus, and His disciples. I'll bring a new appreciation to the Word of God. Let us know what you think. Feel free to contact us at 719-243-0996 or go to His Kingdom Radio website, www.hkrshineon.net. Send us an email if you have any questions or prayer needs. Hope to hear back from you soon. And remember, God has a name. Do you know His name? And He's chosen you by name to be His very own. Shalom Aleichem, my friends. All right, welcome back. We're going to come up with the final conclusion of our story here. So, the Israelites 
come through all this trauma and drama and, and all kinds of grumbling and complaining. What is the lesson? Pastor Jim, what are we supposed to learn from this? I'm not an Israelite. I'm not a slave. Yes, but you're a slave to sin, aren't you? You're a slave to your own selfish desires. You're a slave to sometimes religion. Religion can bring all kinds of slavery in a person's life. Even, you know, sometimes we do godly things for ungodly reasons. <laughs> we need to pay attention. Let him purify our hearts. So Moses used his staff, which I believe represented uh, Jesus, being the rock being struck represents Yeshua Jesus. And the water, living water, flowed from that rock and came a place of refreshment for the people. Uh, then they, they came and they fought with the king Amalek and Moses and Joshua chose men to go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I'll stand at the top of the hill with God's staff in my hand. Joshua did as Moses had told him and fought with Amalek. Then Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. When Moses had his hands up, he prevailed against their enemies. But when he let them down, Amalek prevailed. However, Moses' hands grew heavy, so they took a stone and put it under his arm, and he sat. And Aaron and Hur held his arms up. On the one side uh, and on the other side, they both held his arms up, steady until sunset. And then Joshua, Yehoshua, defeated Amalek, putting their people to the sword. The Lord said to Moses, write this in the book to be remembered and tell it to Joshua. I will completely blot out the memory of the Malachites, or King Amalek, under the heaven. Moses built an altar to the Lord and called it Nisi, which means in Hebrew, my banner. Yehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. And said, because their hand was against me, the throne of Yah, the Lord will fight Amalek generation after generation. So, even after all of this stuff, God, they go into battle against the king of the Amalekites, and through his hands were held up, and, and really, in my mind, in the shape of a cross. When that, when that was occurring, the people would win. When Moses put his arms down, he's like, I'm tired. The people start to lose. There's a moral lesson in that. Keep your eyes on the cross. Keep your eyes on Jesus himself, on Yeshua, and let his kingdom come, and his will be done here on earth as it is in heaven in your life. Now, today, we don't do physical warfare against physical people. But according to the book of Ephesians and in Galatians, we do spiritual warfare against uh, forces of wickedness and darkness and uh, demonic forces in high places. So we need to maintain this lesson. The words of our mouth change the course of the battle. We learn this all throughout the Old Testament. So continue to not grumble and complain. Let's get through the wilderness quickly by closing this, opening these, and opening these. Listen to the Lord. Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. The Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. And then Yeshua added in love your neighbor as yourself from Leviticus 19, 18. So let's stay focused on that. So Father, we thank you for this time together. We pray for your Holy Spirit to bring understanding to help us to learn as we walk through the deserts in our lives, to help us to learn to, to stop grumbling and complaining and to praise you in all that we say and do and to allow our hearts to be circumcised unto you, born again from pillow to pillow, as my buddy Jake always says, that we come to a place of recognizing who is the Lord our God and how do we serve him with our whole hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen and amen. Have a blessed day, my friends. And we'll be back soon with another Torah portion. If you have a prayer request or have any questions, contact Digital Pastor Jim at 719-243-0996. That phone number again is 719-243-0996. Or text him at that number. Or email us at the Wild Branch Ministries at gmail.com. Your tax deductible donations to these ministries are greatly appreciated. 